thyroid and parathyroid physiology today, um, or what I know about it at least. <laughs> so forgive me if there's any errors. So initially, I'm just going to talk through adrenal physiology. Um, so just briefly about the adrenal glands. So they are also known as the suprarenal glands. They're located above the kidneys. Um, they're quite small. They're about two and a half grams each. Uh, and they're responsible for manufacturing and secreting hormones that modulate the function of every tissue, organ and gland in the body. Um, and they maintain homeostasis during stress as well. Why isn't this moving? Okay, so um, blood supply. So the adrenal glands. Uh, so you split it in. So you split it in three. So uh, supplied by the superior suprarenal artery, which is a branch of the inferior phrenic artery. Um, the middle is supplied by the middle suprarenal artery, which is a branch of the aorta, and the inferior suprarenal artery, which is blunt branch of the renal artery. Um, so you just need to remember it's split into three um, for, for those. And then the venous drainage um, is via the suprarenal veins, um, but they drain into different main veins on each side. So on the right, um, it goes straight into the IVC. Um, and then on the left hand side, it drains either into the left renal or the left inferior phrenic vein. Um, in terms of its nerve supply, so it's got a really rich nerve supply and it receives branches from the celiac, celiac plexus and thoracic splanchnic nerves. Um, so in terms of the anatomy, so there's two bits to the, to the adrenal gland. So there's the outer cortex, um, which sort of embryologically is derived from the mesoderm and that accounts for the cortex is, is about 90% of the total volume of the adrenal glands. Um, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail later, but... Hey. What's that? Hello? Did somebody say there's noise in the background? Sorry, Kesh, we just had a bit of uh, cross talk. It's sorted now. Keep going, mate. Sorry. OK, OK. Um, so, um, yeah, so basically the cortex is uh, responsible for production of the hormones. Um, so you remember that by GFR. So there's three layers to it. Um, so the glomerulosa, the fasciculata and the reticulosa. Um, so GFR and um, the glomerulosa is produces the mineral mineralocorticoids the fasciculata is uh, is the glucocorticoids so cortisol and the reticulosa is responsible for producing the androgens um, so that's just a, a way of remembering it and then the medulla which uh, embryologically is from the neuroectoderm uh, is comprised of chromaffin or uh, cells which are also known as uh, pheochromocytes and basically the medulla acts as um, a specialized autonomic ganglion and that's responsible for producing catecholamines as a result of sympathetic stimulation. So as I just said the medulla is produ it produces releases catecholamines uh, and it effectively be behaves like a postganglionic neuron. Um, there's a couple of differences. So it mainly secre secretes adrenaline about 80 percent um, and the others uh, and the other is 20 percent of NORAD. Um, and it's secreted as a hormone, not a neurotransmitter. There are small amounts of dopamine and there's a few other substances that it produces so ATP and adrenomedullin, um, but they don't really know what these things do um, in, the, in the degree to which they're secreted. So, um, and you can, in equate, you can equate the adrenaline and noradrenaline um, sim, uh, stim, uh, secretion. It's about 0.2 mics per kilo per minute of adrenaline and 0.05 mics per kilo per minute of norad. Um, and it's responsible for uh, sympathetic tone. So 
although the adrenal medulla is part of the endocrine system, it's anatomically and physiologically part of the autonomic nervous system and it regulates visceral function. Um, so just have a look at that picture. And so from T1 to L2, um, you've got sympathetic fibres that originate from the cell bodies and the lateral horns, and you can see them coming out um, with the anterior spinal nerve roots, and they uh, separate as white rami and go into the sympathetic ganglion. Um, and these preganglionic fibres can synapse in, in adjacent ganglion, and they can go up or down the chain and synapse in different ganglia. Um, so basically, the adrenal medulla is is a postganglionic neuron of the sympathetic of a sympathetic ganglion without an axon or dendrite. And I've seen that come up in a few questions, so just remember that a little bit. And this just shows um, that basically. So um, you can see at the top. Um, so sorry, not the top. So at the bottom here, um, adrenals and and the postganglionic, instead of it being a neurotransmitter, it's the adrenaline and noradrenaline that works as a, dish, as a hormone in the blood. So what are catecholamines? So um, catecholamines are all derived from the amino acid tyrosine or phenylalanine. Um, so tyrosine is, so this is production of, of catecholamine. So, um, Tyrosine is taken up by the chromaffin cells or the phagochromocytes of the medulla and they're converted into, so the end product is adrenaline. You'll see on the next picture, on the next slide, but um, it's converted to adrenaline and noradrenaline via this series of reactions. Um, and this comes up in some questions as well. So um, what are the enzymes required? Um, so the first step is producing um, dopa, so that's uh, dopa from tyrosine, and the enzyme is tyrosine hydroxylase, and that's the first step, and that happens in the cytosol. And the rate, uh, it's a rate limited step, rate limiting step by noradrenaline. And then you get dopa decarboxylase, which is the enzyme that uh, produces dopamine from dopa, and then they are. Um, bundle up into a secretory vesicle um, and therefore dopamine can be used. And then to go from dopamine to noradrenaline, you have beta hydroxylation. Um, and then this is the next picture. So you can see the end product is adrenaline on, on this one. And so going from noradrenaline to adrenaline, that's controlled by this long one phenyl ethanolamine i can't even say that n methyl transferase yeah that one um so that's that's converting it from noradrenaline to adrenaline um and this is only present in the adrenal medulla and in a small number of cns cells so that's um, important to remember um and adrenaline is actively tra transported back into vesicles for storage um so there's a couple of enzymes um, that are involved. So monoamine oxidase, MAL, MAL and COM-T, so catecholomethyltransferase. So they're present in the cytoplasm of chromaffin cells and um, COM-T predominates. So this, if, if you look at the bottom image, um, this is the enzyme that, converts adrenaline and noradrenaline to metanephrine and normetanephrine and the end product is VMA. Um, you get quite a lot of loss of um, you get quite a lot of loss of catecholamines to VMA. About 90% is lost. The half-life of catecholamine stores is about eight to twelve hours. But when the actual catecholamine is released into the circulation from the adrenal medulla, it's very short lived. So it's, it lasts 30 to 90 seconds. And primarily, it's degrade, uh, they're degraded, the noradrenaline and adrenaline degraded by COM T. That mainly happens in the liver. 
um, but also happens in the kidneys and target organs. Um, whereas in the synapse, noradrenaline is degraded by mainly by MAO. MAO. So where do catecholamines have their effect? So both adrenaline and noradrenaline have a different degree of action um, on adrenergic receptors. Uh, so all adrenergic receptors are G-protein linked receptors. Um, but um, the second messenger systems differ. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about this because it's it's obviously related, but it goes, I'm sure you guys might have come across this from, from elsewhere. But there's two types of alpha receptor. Um, so there's alpha receptors and beta receptors. So you can see that on the left, the alpha receptors here. And, and they are classified depending on what their actions are. So alpha-1, um, as I'm sure you know, is to do with vascular smooth muscle contraction. Um, and, and you also get glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis and relaxation of a, of a pregnant uterus. And then, so that happens via the second messenger system. So it involves phospholipase and PIP2, IP3 and DAG, and it all, all ends up in, in intracellular cal calcium release. And alpha-2 is slightly more complex. Um, so it uh, reduces the sympathetic outflow peripherally and within the CNS. However, there's also a subset of alpha-2 receptors that act in a similar way to alpha-1. So you get in inhibition of noradrenaline release and you get smooth muscle contraction depending on whether it's, it's via adenyl cyclase or via calcium, intracellular calcium release. Um, and then there's three types of beta receptors. Um, so there's beta one, um, which are involved in my increasing um, myocardial con contractility and increasing renin secretion. Um, beta-2 receptors relax smooth muscle, so vascular and um, bronchial smooth muscle, um, and you get glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, and it also increases insulin secretion and renin secretion. And then beta-3 I don't know what the actual clinical significance of it is, but um, it, it's, I, I've never really come across this, to be honest. But um, you get lipolysis and adipose tissue and bladder relaxation. And then dopamine is mainly a neurotransmitter and it doesn't cross the blood brain, brain barrier. Um, and we obviously use that um, with exogenous um, dopamine uh, and you get a dose related effect. So Initially, you get um, activation of dopamine receptors, peripheral dopamine receptors, and at higher doses, they actually work on alpha and then beta receptors. So I talked earlier about, the, so that was all about the medulla. So going to the adrenal cortex, so you remember the GFR. Um, just briefly, I don't know, so e-learning for health goes into a bit of detail. I don't really know if you need to know this, but I'll talk briefly about it, about the embryology. Seems a bit much, but um, adrenal steroids are essential for intrauterine homeostasis. And basically in the embryo, you get mainly DHEAS, that long one, and a smaller amount of cortisol. And these are produced in the fetal zone, which, which after birth can be completely involute. Um, itself and surrounding this fetal zone you get a definitive zone and later you get the transitional zone and the adrenal cortex actually develops from those structures and the medulla um, doesn't exist in a fetal life it um, develops over about 18 months and then the zona reticularis which is involved in the um, is where the androgens are produced is that develops so between three and eight years so you may want to completely ignore that. I don't know how much detail we need to know that in, but yeah. So um, all of the hormones are 
derived from cholesterol. So they're brought to the cell by LDL and HDL. And when that happens, the side chains are removed and that's a rate limiting step. And they are, um, you get this pregnenolone, I think that's right in, in how I'm saying it. So that's the last common precursor. So that's a 21 carbon molecule. And so cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and it's the pr principal glucocorticoid, is produced in the zona fasciculata and the reticularis. Um, and corticosteroid, corticosterone, this is produced, but only in really small amounts. And it's a precursor to aldosterone as well. And it has weak glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid actions. So cortisol, um, so it's a stress hormone and it's it has a pulsatile secretion um, with superimposed circadian rhythm. And you get this peak, I, sh I didn't put the graph in, but you get this peak at 8 a.m. Um, with a normal sleep-wake cycle. Um, it's a dependent hormone and ACTH, which I'm not going to go into too much detail because it probably is covered in the next lecture, but um, ACTH directly stimulates the production of this via membrane-bound G-protein G couple receptors. It's a catabolic hormone, so it causes gluconeogenesis and it has anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive um, effects um, at high, well, the immunosuppressive effects at, at high pharmacological doses. Um, and in health, you get about 20 milligrams of cortisol produced per day, um, which is highly pro protein bound um, to mainly cortisol binding protein and transcortin. So about 60, 80% is, is bound to that and about 15 to 35% to albumin. Uh, the elimination half-life of unbound cortisol is two hours, but it maintains a, a steady concentration because it's really uh, stuck to protein. Um, cortisol is mainly uh, metabolized in the liver, but also in the kidneys, and that happens by several different pathways. And the metabolites are ultimately excreted in the urine and you can measure this. So it's 17 hydroxycorticosteroid and you can actually, you can take that and, and see what rate of cortisol you're producing. So mineralocorticoids. So this is, um, so in your GFR, this is created in the G, so the glomerulosa. And aldosterone is the principal mineralocorticoid. And Although ACTH is responsible for maintaining the function of the whole adrenal cortex, it's angiotensin II that regulates production and release of aldosterone. And aldosterone release, as I'm sure you know, is the endpoint of the, the renal angiotensin aldosterone system. So similar to cortisol, aldosterone is, a, is also a 21 carbon steroid. And the target uh, at which aldosterone exerts its action is in the, is in the distal convoluted tubule, um, and it acts to conserve sodium and, and water. So it acts at the, it stimulates the basolateral sodium potassium ATPase, and it opens luminal channels, and, and that's that's where it has its effect. Um, so androgens. Uh, are 19 carbon compounds, not 21. So these are 19 carbon compounds. And these are produced in the zona fasciculata and the, but mainly the reticularis. So your R of the GFR. Okay. So the two major androgens are DHEA and DHEAS. And these are weak sex hormones, but when they go into either the testes or the ovaries, they're converted into more, more potent um, testosterone and estrogens. And again, they're controlled by ACTH. So that's it on the adrenal glands. So then I'm just gonna talk about thyroid and parathyroid physiology. So 
thyroid hormones um, act throughout the body to control growth and metabolism. Um, and that's via intracellular receptors. Um, and these are controlled by feedback mechanisms, um, the release, synthesis and release are controlled by the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary hormones. And then closely related to this is calcium homeostasis. So that's achieved by um, the parathyroid hormone, um, D hormone and calcitonin, which we'll talk about as well. So first, the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland um, has two flat lobes linked by an isthmus. Um, it's just anterior to the trachea and inferior to the thyroid and cricoid cartilages. Um, it has its innervation is so its autonomic innervation is via the superior laryngeal nerve and the re recurrent laryngeal nerve, and the blood supply is. Uh, via the superior thyroid artery, which is a branch of the external carotid. You can see that in the, in the picture here um, coming down. And then the inferior thyroid artery, uh, which is part of the thyrocervical trunk. And then sometimes um, this thyroid artery, which is a branch of the subclavian. Um, its venous drainage is from the superior thyroid veins, which drain into the internal jugular vein and the inferior thyroid vein which is um, goes into the left brachycephalic vein. So microscopically the th so so the thyroid gland microscopically um, so each lobe is composed of these spherical follicles um, so they're epithelial cells kind of in a in a un functional unit um, so, and you can see in the middle, it's got this colloid in the middle. So that's the cavity and that contains thyroglobulin. So thyroglobulin is an iodinated glycoprotein um, that's made by these epithelial cells and they're stored in this, in, in the colloid. Um, so the thyroid hormones, so that's thyroxine, which is T4 and triiodothyronine, which is T3 they're assembled in the colloid um, before they're transported um, out into the capillary bloodstream by endocytosis. And I'm going to go on to that in a bit more detail in a sec. And then you've got these C cells as well, which um, these are completely separate. And this is to do with the calcium metabolism bit, and which I'll go into. So thyroglobulin, um, is rich in tyrosine residues and they're required for production of thyroid hormones. Um, so thyroglobulin is synthesized on ribosomes which are uh, bound to carbohydrate in the Golgi apparatus and these are packaged into vesicles before um, they move into the colloid by like, exocytosis. Um, and you need dietary iodide um, which is actively taken up from the blood from the influence of TSH. So you need TSH to take this iodide up. And synthesis of, of um, T3 and T4 um, is supported by membrane uh, peroxidases, which, which oxidize iodide to iodine. Um, and you can see that in the picture there. And it's, it's, tight, it's regulated uh, via TSH and um, I'm, I'm sure the next lecture might go into some detail about it, about it but it's um, you've got TRH uh, so that's from the hypothalamus and that is released that that drives the TSH release um, from the anterior pituitary and this is basically a negative feedback loop so thyroid um, stimulating hormone itself acts on G protein couple receptors that are on the surface of the thyroid epithelial cells. Um, and under this influence, the hormones are secreted um, by pinocytosis and lysosomes cleave the thyroglobulin to release the unbound T3 and T4 into the blood. And once T3 and T4 go into the bloodstream, they rapidly become bound to globulin or albumin. So they're again, very protein bound. And 
uh, thyroid hormones influence um, intracell so they're intracellular uh, hormones and they work by altering DNA transcription within the nucleus. T3 is about three times as potent as T4 and it's much fat, faster acting so we're talking hours instead of days and T4 acts as, as a pro-hormone and it's peripherally converted to T3 in the li liver and the kidney and it has its effects via on, on oxidative metabolism and your basal metabolic rate uh, and therefore your heat production um, and that's what T3 and T4 do. Um, you also get a byproduct of peripheral de-iodination in terms of reverse T3. I think the only uh, clinical thing with that is that fasting increases the ratio of reverse T3 to T3 um, so you get you get more reverse T3, uh, which is me metabolically inactive. And then calcium homeostasis. So calcium is a really important iron, which is involved in muscular contraction, uh, clotting and in, in bone as well. And it also acts as an important second messenger. As vast body stores of calcium. Um, and the plasma concentration is maintained at 2.25 to 2.65 millimoles per litre. And about half of the plasma calcium is actually freely available, so ionised. And of the rest, about 10% is bound in complexes and about 40% is protein bound. And calcium is tightly regulated and that's achieved by these three things that I've discussed earlier. So parathyroid hormone, um, D hormone and calcitonin. And they act on the gut to alter the absorption, on bone to affect the deposition and breakdown, and in the kidney to alter the excretion. So parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormones are peptide are produced by the parathyroid parathyroid gland which are attached to the thyroid lobes um, so you get release of parathyroid hormone in response to hypocalcemia and of course you get decreased in um, hypercalcemia and parathyroid hormone has effects in two main places so uh, when it's secreted it acts on the bone by increasing osteoclast activity um, and so that produces calcium into the bloodstream and in the kidney you get increased reabsorption of, of calcium in, in, in the kidney in the tubular calcium you get decreased phosphate reabsorption and it increases formation of D hormone as well it also indirectly parathyroid hormone also increases gut absorption of calcium by stimulating production of D-hormone. So 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol is um, D-hormone. So vitamin D is cholecalciferol. Um, that's a precursor to D-hormone. And we can, in our bodies, we're able to convert 7-dehydroxycholesterol, which is produced in the liver, to cholecalciferol in the skin when we go out in the sun. Not on a day like today, but normally. Um, and cholecalciferol is hydroxylated in the liver to 25-hydroxycholecalciferol. Um, um, and in the kidney, it's then... Um, change to D-hormone and then you get a fin final um, one hydroxylation under the influence of parathyroid hormone in response to hypocalcemia um, and so D-hormone acts via intracellular nuclear receptors to increase your calcium um, so D-hormone acts in the gut so you absorb more calcium from the diet um, in the bone it it increases demineralization and in the kidneys by reabsorption of calcium and an increased reabsorption of phosphate. Um, calcium, sorry, calcitonin is a peptide hormone 
produced by the pal parafollicular C cells in the thyroid gland. And that's produced in response to hypercalcemia. So just think of this as opposite um, to parathyroid hormone. And it acts by um, inhibiting osteoclast activity. So basically that's, I think that's it. So that is all of those three things, which is quite a lot. <laughs> so any questions? So if you've got any questions, you can put them in the chat. Uh, thank you, Rakesh. That was a really good run through what is a very complex and slightly dry topic, unfortunately. Um, yeah. The problem with it is, is that it's really it's in the curriculum and it's easy exam fodder. They can keep asking the same questions because nothing really changed. Mm. So. I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on the embryology thing, because there was a lot about it in e-learning for health. But I don't really know how much you need to know about the embryology of <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what I was going to ask you actually um, mm. you're talking about the adrenal effects on the receptors and stuff do you know how that's different in the neonate and the child um, apart from what not more than what I briefly saw on that in on e-learning for health to be honest no I don't no, that's fine. Uh, not a lot, lot, not a lot of people do, but obviously, as mm. I'm a anaesthetist, it's one of my areas. Mm. Um, the way that I think about it is, the neonate uh, has very poor levels of alpha receptors mm -hmm. when they're born, and that may be related to the the reduction in the, in the growth of the medulla over the first eighteen months. So, low levels of alpha receptors means that the neonate's not responsive to NORAD and poorly responsive to adrenaline as a vasoconstrictor. So if you're ever doing neonatal anesthesia with ourselves, that you'll notice that we don't use norad and adrenaline infusions as our first line hypotensive agents. We use dopamine and dopamine because there are more dopamine receptors in the neonate. Um, what the neonate does have is beta receptors, so they get an increased heart rate. So if you ever notice with neonates, we won't use adrenaline to increase blood pressure. We will use adrenaline to increase heart rate, therefore increase cardiac output, and therefore uh, blood supply. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, that makes the other thing to note as well is that the uh, low levels of cortisol in the in the child up to 18 months um, and the development of that medulla are the reason that children don't sleep on a normal pattern. Mm -hmm. So your cortisol is very important in your sleep wake cycle. So the reason that young kids have a very well, 18 month olds have a very strange sleep pattern is because they don't have the cortisol levels to balance their wakefulness and their sleep patterns. Does anybody else have any other questions? Is anybody else awake out there? <laughs> Stunned into silence or sleep. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm very glad that you did it, uh, Rakesh, because it's it is a it is a it is a core topic, but unfortunately, it is it is very dry, isn't it? But thank yeah, you. It is. <laughs> uh, so next up is uh, Evie with uh, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Evie, are you with us? Yes, I'm there with you. Uh, I don't know if you can see the presentation. Uh, not yet. I'm doing it now. Okay, and share. Yeah, I think we're there. Do we have to also switch on the camera or it can be done without it? That's, that's uh, fine. It is entirely up to you. It's entirely okay, up to you. I'll, I'll decide then not to. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, oh, yes. so can I start? Yep. Okay, very good. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Evi and I'm an ST4 in anesthetics and ICM. So today I was asked to present regarding the physiology of the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. So the learning objectives of this presentation will be to try to explain the interrelationships of the anatomy and functions of the hypothalamus and the posterior and anterior lobes of the pituitary glands identify the hormones that they are produced from the anterior and the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Also, to speak a little bit about their principal actions. And I don't know, I think it was quite interesting to also include a part 
regarding the uh, hypothalamic and pituitary disease and some anesthetic implications, which I have seen that they are asked actually quite often in exams. Now, starting uh, the hypothalamus, I don't know, can you see the mouse here? Can you see it on the presentation? No, no, we can't. No. Okay, that's all right. So as you can see here on the picture on the right side, hypothalamus lies um, inferior and anterior to the thalamus. Um, it is in a blue green kind of color and it connects to the pituitary gland by the stalk like infidibulum. You cannot see it really here like the infidibulum is, is orange. Um, so the pituitary gland, on the other hand, you can see it uh, beneath the infidibulum. It consists of two lobes, the anterior, which is the green part, and the posterior lobe, which is a bit of purple kind of parts. Uh, its lobe secretes different hormones in response to signals from the hypothalamus. So the two lobes, they're separated by the pars intermedia. And the whole pituitary gland itself, it is located in the uh, pituitary fossa. So it's also named Sella Tursica. This is actually a depression of the sphenoid bone and uh, the central portion of the middle cranial fossa. Now, in general, what are the functions of the hypothalamus? So actually it offers a link between the brain, the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system, meaning that it has an important autonomic role. It plays a role in thermoregulation, in the regulation of hunger, the regulation of body work, water, sleep awake cycle, um, in the behavior, the regulation of sexual function, and last but not least, the control of the pituitary function. And how that happens is that the hypothalamus, it secretes hormones. In total, there are six. Two of them, they have an inhibitory action on the pituitary gland, and four, they're stimulating. So as you can see here on the right side of the picture and in the yellow, let's say, table, uh, we have corticotropin releasing hormone CRH that it um, induces the secretion of ACTH. We have thyrotropin releasing hormone or TRH that it increases the secretion of TSH from the pituitary gland. We have growth hormone releasing hormone or else GHRH um, and gonadotropin releasing hormone GN. RH that stimulates the suppression of FSH and LH from the pituitary glands. And then, as I promised you, we have the two inhibitory hormones. So we have the somatostatin releasing inhibitory factor and the prolactin inhibitory factor. As you can all understand this, they just inhibit the secretion of somatostatin and prolactin from the pituitary glands. Now, I know it's a bit boring, but we have to also to talk a little bit about the anatomical relationships of the pituitary glands. So, uh, superiorly, as you can see here on the image on the right side, lies the optic ias, the hypothalamus, and the third ventricle. Anterior and inferior, we have the, sphenoidal, um, the sphenoid sinus and the sphenoid bone. Uh, posteriorly lies the midbrain and the pons. And laterally, we have the cavernous sinus uh, that contains the internal carotid artery, cranial nerve six, and then a little bit more laterally, we have cranial nerves three, four, and the first and the second parts of the trigeminal nerve. Now, why do we care about all that? Because whenever there is a pathology in the pituitary glands, for example, there might be a large tumor, then we have compression of these nearby structures. And therefore, we're going to have neurological symptoms like bitemporal hemianopia, loss of visual acuity, hydrocephalus, diplopia, and of course, hyposecretion of the rest of the hormones. Going a little bit further into the pituitary gland right now. So as we said, we have the anterior and we have the posterior pituitary. So regarding the posterior, um, it releases two hormones, oxytocin and uh, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Now, what is nice about these two hormones is actually that they're not produced by the posterior pituitary. They're just produced by the hypothalamus uh, from the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus. And then when they are produced 
they just travel with the hypothalamophysial tracts. So it's it's like nerve endings, right? Just just think of it as nerves. So they travel down, they go to the posterior to the posterior pituitary, and then they are stored or released into the blood via the capillary plexuses. Uh, regarding the anterior pituitary glands, so uh, the difference from the posterior is that it actually makes its own hormones. There are seven hormones produced for which we're going to talk a little bit later. Uh, the hypothalamus has the role that it produces, as we discussed earlier, stimulating hormones or inhibiting hormones. These hormones travel uh, to the anterior pituitary via the hypophysial portal system. So this is the portal system is actually like a bit of a complex system of capillaries and it is mainly formed uh, by uh, the superior uh, hypophysial arteries and the inferior hypophysial arteries. Regarding the hormones produced by the anterior pituitary glands, so you can see right down on the picture, we have TSH that it acts on the thyroid glands, we have ACTH that acts on the adrenal cortex, FSH and LH, that they act upon the testes or the ovaries. We have growth hormone, which actually acts throughout, throughout the whole body. Prolactin, which acts to the mammary glands. And endorphins, uh, although this is not very, very, let's say, well, um, uh, well said and well, yeah, and not, we're not really examined about that. Um, so these endorphins, they are, they actually act to pain receptors in the brain. Now, from all these hormones, I consider that we should pay a little bit more attention, and I have seen it in exams, to the ACTH and the growth hormone. In general, when we're talking about pituitary disease, um, it can present with three, let's say, manifestations. Either we're going to have excess hormone secretion, either we're going to have underactivity of the gland, or it can present with um, a mass effect and neurological symptoms as we discussed earlier. Now, if we go to excess of hormone secretions, um, mainly it's due to adenomas which can be micro or, um, or micro adenomas and they consist 10 percent of all cranial tumors they're mainly benign and this can either be functional uh, and produce hormones which is actually the 75 percent of the cases or they can be non-functional um, other kind of um, uh, inherited tumors they, um, that can happen, and they include um, the pituitary um, uh, cancers, they can be as part of the multiple endocrine neoplasia sy um, uh, syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant, and uh, at the same time we have tumors in the pituitary gland, the pancreas, and the thyroid. Um, regarding underactivity that comes up from pituitary disease, we can either have the lack of one of the hormones, and then we talk about hypopituitarism, or we can have the lack of all the hormones uh, due to tumor, trauma, it can be atrogenic after, for example, an operation, autoimmune, um, or it can happen due to pituitary disease. So here also I have included Sehan syndrome, which will be important when you will go and you will do obstetrics. Um, um, so Sehan syndrome happens due to uh, low blood supply um, uh, to, um, to the pituitary gland, and it happens mainly after labor when there has been a massive uh, obstetric hemorrhage. Now let's focus a little bit to the growth hormone. So it is a peptide hormone. It stimulates in general the growth, uh, the cell reproduction and the cell regeneration. Um, as we see in the picture on the right side, hypothalamus secretes GnRH, which acts upon the pituitary glands, which secretes growth hormones, and then mainly through the liver, um, it activates the uh, synthesis and secretion of insulin grown factor one, which actually acts upon the bones, the muscle, and the fats. 
Um, I have to say here that there is also somatostatin. This is one of the inhibitory hormones that we discussed earlier, that it actually inhibits the release of growth hormone from the pituitary glands. Regarding pathophysiological conditions, when we have hyposecretion of growth hormone, we're talking about dwarfism, and this has to do in childhood. Um, when we have hypersecretion of growth hormones, we will talk either about gigantism when this has happened in childhood or acromegaly when this happens in adult life. Now regarding acromegaly, um, you have to know about that. There are questions in both the primary and the final actually of RCA. Um, it is important to recognize it and know a little bit about it. So it has a lot of important anesthetic implications. As you all expect, it definitely has a difficult airway. And this has to do with uh, macroglossia, with the fact that uh, these patients, they have an enlarged jaw. You have thickened pharyngeal and laryngeal soft tissue and vocal cords. Uh, the laryngeal aperture, it is decreased. They often present with obstructive sleep apnea and they have um, thyroid enlargements. Now, these patients, they also have associated morbidity. Uh, so they, have, they can be hypertensive. They can have um, hypertrophy of the left ventricle. They may have fibrosis, uh, heart failure and atherosclerosis. And um, they also present with diabetes. Other issues that you might have in these situations, and they're, they're really big, these patients, they're really tall, and their skin is really, really different than the normal one. So you might have issues with positioning, cannulation, etc. Now, the second hormone that I would like to focus on is ACTH. So uh, it is an important component uh, of the axis. And um, as it was said in the previous presentation, it is produced in response to biological stress. And its principal effects are to increase the production and release of cortisol by the cortex of the adrenal glands. Um, in syndromes of hyposuppressions, we have adrenal insufficiency. So um, if the disease is in the pituitary gland, then we're talking about secondary adrenal insufficiency. If the disease is due to hypothalamic lesions, then we're talking about tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Now, when we have over secretion of ACTH, and especially when it has to do with the pituitary tumor that leads to, hypo, to that leads to, um, or a hypothalamic, sorry, tumor or any other pathology that leads to overproduction of CRF and increased ACTH and increased cortisol, then we're talking about Cushing's disease. Uh, in cases that we have insufficiency of um, um, ACTH, then actually we're talking um, the clinical image that you're going to have is the same as you have Addison's disease. So in Addison's disease, uh, you have um, chronic manifestations, but you also have acute manifestations. And then we're talking about um, an Addisonian crisis. So these patients, they have a hyperpigmentation of the skin. They have low blood pressure, weakness. They present with weight loss. They have gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, constipation. And of course, when they're going to have when they're going to present with an Addisonian crisis, then the whole clinical picture is more dramatic and they might present with uh, convulsions, severe hypoglycemia, hyponatremia and severe vomiting and diarrhea that leads to uh, hypertension and electrolyte abnormalities. Now, um, regarding the Cushing syndrome, um, again, it is important, especially when you're an anesthetist because it has an aesthetic implications. Um, of course, one more time, it has a difficult airway. We expect a difficult airway, and this has to do with the central obesity and the buffalo hump that they have on their neck. Um, other complications are hypertension, again, hypertrophy uh, of the left ventricle and heart failure. They present with diabetes. And just because we have an increase in the cortisol, you also have electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia. Now, um, strictly when we're talking about Cushing syndrome, uh, we refer to the excess of cortisol, that it can be of any etiology. 
Cushing's disease, remember that it has to do with a tumor in the pituitary gland that it will lead to an increased ACTH and then increased cortisol. Yeah? The Cushing syndrome, um, it can be either um, exogenous or endogenous. The exogenous is actually states when we're doing something like as doctors. So either we're giving uh, exogenous, exogenous glucocorticoids or ACDH. Well, when we're talking about the endogenous causes of Cushing syndrome, this can either be um, ACTH independent. So when the pathology is mainly in the adrenal glands, and this can happen due to adenomas, carcinomas, or hyperplasia of the adrenal glands. Um, however, there are also inherited conditions such as the mccunnell bright syndrome. Now, when we're talking about ACTH dependent causes, um, so in these situations, we have an increase, uh, an excess actually of cortisol in the body, and this can be due to ectopic lesions. So this is really um, common and often in uh, bronchial carcinoids and uh, pancreatic tumors. Um, it can be due to hypothalamic lesions or pituitary lesions. Um, this can be tested clinically with a dexamethasone test. I don't think that I will need to go into further details about that. I'm not very sure they will ask you something like this. Now, the hormones of the posterior of the posterior um, um, pituitary gland, we said that there are two. We have first the antidiuretic hormone or ADH uh, in abbreviation. So the role of this hormone is to regulate the water and sodium reabsorption from the kidney. So as you can see in the small picture on the left side, um, whenever there is um, an increase in plasma osmolality, this is sensed by osmoreceptors that uh, are in the hypothalamus. Then um, there is um, an increase of uh, ADH release from the pituitary gland, leading to increased water reabsorption and a decrease in plasma osmolality. This then acts as a feedback, uh, negative feedback mechanism that decreases the ADH release and it acts back to the hypothalamus. So causes um, of um, um, loss of balance uh, in the secretion of the antidiuretic hormone can be trauma, surgery, infection, toxins or tumours. And we have two separate clinical entities. So when we have over suppression of ADH, then we're going to talk about the syndrome of inappropriate suppression of ADH or in abbreviation CIASI. Uh, when we have under suppression of ADH, then we're talking about central diabetes insipidus. And you can see in the picture on the right side, um, there are main differences or almost opposite. Um, so in diabetes insipidus, uh, the central type, we have low water in the body, we have a high urine output, um, and we have high sodium, and we have a high osmolality due to dehydration. So these patients, uh, they are in high risk of hypovolemic shock, and the treatment is to give desmopressin. In the syndrome of inappropriate secretion of ADH, on the other hand, uh, we have water intoxication. So the patients are oliguric, they have low sodium, which is dilutional, they have low serum osmolality, weight gain, and there are increased risk to present with seizures. The therapy in this situation is hypertonic saline. Last but not least, we have oxytocin, uh, which is secreted by the posterior uh, pituitary glands. So its role is mainly in pregnancy, uh, which uh, it increases the intensity and the effectiveness of uterine contractions and prompts additional dilatation of the cervix. Uh, but it also has effects after birth such as the milk ejection reflex in breastfeeding women, and um, it contributes to the parent and newborn broadening uh, known as attachment. Oxytocin is also called the love hormones because it is involved in the feelings of love and closeness, as well in the sexual response. Um, that's it actually from our point of view. Thank you for listening.
Great, thank you very much, Evie. Um, great presentation and nicely clinically related as well. That's really good. Does anybody have any questions? I was very clear. <laughs> yeah, well, you, yeah, you were very clear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I couldn't even think of anything either. I'm, uh, so, um, if everyone's happy, we can move on to the MCQ quiz then. So, that's uh, Shannon, I believe. Are you there? Yep. Cool. Um, I'll just try and upload it. How do you upload it from the shared area? So if you go on to share, can you see yeah. where, have you got PowerPoint and browse? No, I've just, oh yeah, wait, no, I've just got Microsoft whiteboard and freehand. Um, do you not have desktop or window? Are you using the app or the website? Yeah, I'm using the app. Uh, you should have PowerPoint and the browse option. If not, I can do it from here and you can take control. Yeah, it might be because I'm using a tablet, so I think it's I can try and up, it says upload from my computer, so I could do that. Uh, I've just got it here. Hang on. Okay. Uh, the crying quiz. There you go. So you should have an option on your screen when it loads up for take control. Yeah, that's it. There you go. All yours. OK, so um, I am going to do the oh, and quiz. Um, so it's quite a big topic, so I just kind of chose some random points of it to uh, do the quiz on. So I'll start off with some multiple true, true, fo true falses. I don't know whether people want to put their answers in the meeting chat again, um, as it just makes it a little bit more interesting. Yeah, can we do that? Make it a bit more interactive. Make everybody up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so first question. So um, first question is regarding the pituitary gland. So A, ADH and oxytocin are made in the posterior pituitary. B, the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus via the hypophyseal stalk. C, the pituitary gland secretes prolactin. And D, the anterior pituitary develops from Rathke's pouch. So I'll give you a minute or so to put in your answers. OK, so um, I think quite a few of you were right. So um, ADH and oxytocin, they're not made in uh, the posterior pituitary. They are, in fact, made in the hypothalamus and secreted from the posterior pituitary, um, like in our last presentation. Um, this is quite a sneaky question, but I did see one very similar to this um, when doing some questions. Uh, the um, pituitary gland and the hypothalamus aren't connected by the hyperphyseal stalk. It's the hypophyseal stalk. So it was just one of those ones we had to read the question really, really closely. Um, it's true uh, the pituitary gland does secrete prolactin. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, again, like um, it was explained in our presentations, um, prolactin is involved in the development of breast tissue breast tissue and milk production. And again, true, the anterior, anterior pituitary develops from Rathke's pouch. Rathke's pouch is basically um, a little ev evagination in the roof of the um, developing mouth. So then second um, MCQ, again, uh, another true false regarding the endocrine glands and hormones. So A, the pineal gland is an endocrine gland. B, 
peptide hormones bind to receptors on cell membranes. C, steroid hormones are synthesized in a series of reactions from cholesterol. And D, in the pancreas, the islets of Langerhans secrete insulin and glucagon. So again, I'll give you 30 seconds or so. Okay, so um, <laughs> all of these uh, were in fact true. So the pineal gland is um, an endocrine gland and it um, produces melatonin. B, uh, again true, peptide hormones um, do bind to receptors on cell membranes rather than enter the cell. Um, peptide hormones include insulin, glucagon, prolactin, ACTH, gastrin and PTH. MC, steroid hormones are synthesized in a series of reactions from cholesterol. Um, and again, examples of steroid hormones include cortisol, aldosterone, estrogen and progesterone. Um, and again, D is true. So um, the islets of Langerhans secrete insulin and glucagon. Glucagon is made in alpha cells, insulin in beta cells. Um, and then the last MCQ question, so uh, regarding the adrenal glands, A, the cortex makes up around 90% of the adrenal gland, B, tyrosine is an essential amino acid, C, catecholamines are produced in the adrenal medulla, and D, circulating catecholamines have a half-life of around 45 minutes. OK, um, so I think most people have answered now. So the answers, um, like in our first presentation, um, I think Rakesh did speak about the cortex um, making up about 90% of the adrenal gland. And B is false. Tyrosine is actually a non-essential amino acid as it can be synthesized, synthesized in the body from phenylalanine. Um, basically, essential amino acids are amino acids that can't be synthesized, so you must get them from the diet. Oh, um, and C was true. Uh, catecholamines are produced in the um, adrenal medulla. It's steroids that are produced in the adrenal cortex. And D is false. Um, Circulating catecholamines have quite a short half life of 30 to 90 seconds, not 45 minutes. And um, so moving on to SBAs. So, out of the following hormones, which is not produced in the anterior pituitary A, growth hormone, B, TSH, C, FSH, D, ACTH, or E, melatonin.
So I think everyone got this one right. Uh, melatonin is in fact produced in the pineal gland and it's involved in um, regulating our sleep wake cycle. Uh, so question five, which of the following is not a response to surgery? A, increased insulin rele release, B, increased ACTH release, C, increased catecholamine release, D, increased glucagon release, or E, increased cortisol. Uh, yeah, so again, um, everyone got on that one right. Uh, insulin secretion is actually reduced during surgery. Um, so in insulin secretion is inhibited by the alpha-2 receptors, which may play a part. And um, usually patients are fasting prior to surgery, so that probably plays, plays a part as well. So then question six, which of the following drugs is most likely to suppress cortisol production, propofol, thio, rocuronium, paracetamol or automidate. Yep, so um, it's E, atomidate. Uh, so atomidate can apparently inhibit cortisol and aldosterone secretion for about eight hours postoperatively. Um, and despite atomidate being uh, very cardiovascularly stable, that's the main reason why it's not really used um, as an induction agent very often. So question seven, which of the following does not stimulate the increased production and secretion of cortisol? Is it A, hypoglycemia, B, surgery, C, ADH, D, opioids or E, critical illness? Yeah, so the, the um, correct answer is D. So opioids actually inhibit the production of cortisol um, and that's uh, because they inhibit CIH release from the hypothalamus. The rest all increase production of cortisol. So question eight, the following is not an effect of thyroxine. A, increased basal metabolic rate. B, increased myelination of nerves, C, increased gastric motility, D, increased anabolism, or E, increased heart rate. Um, so it's actually D, uh, thyroxine increases catabolism, um, so the fat, the, which is the breakdown of fat and protein. Um, and I think one of the easiest ways to remember the effects of thyroxine is to uh, think about patients who are hyper and hypothyroid and what symptoms and signs do they have. So that's why I've got that little picture um, there. And if you think about it, um, hyperthyroid patients, um, they've often got muscle wasting and they're very thin, um, in part due to the increased catabolism and increased basal metabolic rate. So um, question nine regarding aldosterone, which of the following is true? Um, so A, it is inhibited by renin. B, it is produced in the zona glomerulosa. C, it acts primarily on the PCT. D, it is stimulated by hypokalemia. Or E, it takes a few minutes to have an effect. 
start to have an effect. So, yeah, the correct answer is B. It is produced in the zona glomerulosa. Um, and aldosterone production is actually stimulated by renin, ACTH, um, hyperkalemia and hyponatremia. Uh, it primarily acts in the late DCT and um, collecting ducts of the kidney to increase, uh, pota pot increase potassium secretion and sodium re reabsorption. Um, and it usually takes a few hours to start to ha have an effect and that's because it acts um, by intracellular uh, receptors and increasing transcription of proteins so that takes a little while and so last question which of the following enzymes converts noradrenaline to adrenaline in the adrenal medulla is it oh, i'm gonna have to say all these now <laughs> dopa decarboxylase I'm sorry, I might have made a mistake on that one. Highlighted the right answer, so you will get that one right. It's B. Um, and here is the diagram that I think Rakesh Rakesh, Rakesh showed in his uh, his presentation. I don't particularly. I can't think of any easy ways to remember the names of the enzymes, etc. So if anyone has thought of anything, please can they share it because. I find it quite hard to remember the names of these enzymes. Okay. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, I don't have a way of remembering those enzymes, unfortunately. Uh, I think I forgot <laughs> most of them after a while. <laughs> um, okay, does anybody have any questions? Lovely. OK, um, I just want to quickly mention before we all uh, wrap up and finish the sec uh, session, the opening uh, window for applying for the primary MCQ is uh, was opened on the 12th of last month and it closes on the 21st of this month uh, for the August sitting of the MCQ SBA's things. Uh, so if you're thinking about doing it, you definitely should. My recommendation is get it done and get it done as quickly as you can. Um, gives you about two months to practice, so that's probably enough time to practice all the stuff um, on top of some reading. So if you're in doubt, you can always contact me for some advice, but I would recommend getting it done as soon as possible. So, um, Shivani's just put up the survey monkey, uh, so she's looking for feedback as ever. Shivani, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, just thanks for coming. Um, also, um, for next week, just talking about next week, I, I, I need someone to do uh, one of the quizzes on equipment. If anyone wants to volunteer, then uh, please do. And uh, thanks for coming and thanks to all the speakers. Really good presentations. Yeah, massive thank you to all the speakers. Uh, it's uh, often a difficult area to teach, but it was uh, it's quite interesting. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, so if that's it, I think we'll conclude the meeting and see you all next week. <laughs>